Carrie. And we are Paranormal Chicks. Episode 33. Our lucky number. Our fave number. Our lucky number. Echo! Echo! We see it everywhere. <laughs> I can't wait till we get 333. Oh, God. Mm-hmm. Or 666. Six, six. Will we ever make it? <laughs> That's a lot. That is a lot. That's like... A lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's 666 Weeps, episodes. Basically. Mm-hmm. Crazy. We can do it. Do you want us to do it? <laughs> <laughs> That's legit, like... Check yes or no, please. But, okay. We have a Patreoner who says she does want us... Okay. ...to do it. Hit me with it. And her name is Mia M. Shout out to you, girl. We see you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. And to everyone who participated in our 13 Days of Halloween. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> I think it was a success. I think so, too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We hope y'all liked it. We did the giveaway last night. It was Halloween. Yeah. And Jenny G won. Mm-hmm. Not Kenny G. Jenny G. He doesn't listen to us. That I know of. Monica. Yep. Yes. Kimberly K. Mm-hmm. And Nicole S. Yep. Congrats. Four winners. Yes, four winners. Congrats to all of y'all. We will be shipping out your goodies. Yes. So they won because they reviewed us on iTunes, Stitcher, and a bunch of other places. And then we put their name in a hat because they screenshotted it and sent it to us. And we did a drawing. Yep. We'll do it again one, one day. Yeah. Maybe in a couple of months. Yep, yep, yep. I think that's it. I think we are ready. Let's just get this show on the Mm -hmm. road. We are ready for a story. Yes. Okay. Picture it. 1906. Ooh. Natal, South Africa. And it's, it all occurred at this place called St. Michael's Mission. Okay. When you said the name of the place, all I thought was Nutella. (laughs) <laughs> my taste buds love Nutella, but my stomach doesn't. Mm-mm. So Both of mine love it. Yeah, you're lucky. My waistline does not. <laughs> <laughs> y'all, if y'all like Nutella and you can handle it, put it on vanilla ice cream. Will change your life and your <laughs> waistline. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, okay. Living proof of both. <laughs> Okay, so what I'm going to talk about centers around one girl, and her name is Clara Germana Sully, or, because I did not find anyone who did not have an accent who said her name, (laughs) so that was like the Southern English way to say it, Okay, but then some other people said Clara Germana Chile. Okay. But I'm just going to call her Clara because I don't know what's right. Okay. Like, they that might have just been their accent. Yeah. You know what I mean? I couldn't Google how to say this name because it didn't come up. Yeah. So you tried. I, I tried. <laughs> I'm not being disrespectful or anything. I just want you all to know I, I tried. Okay, so she was attending school at that St. Michael's Mission. She had been orphaned by her parents as an infant and started to attend the school when she was four. Poor baby. Yeah. So fast forward to 1906. She's 16 years old. Like, just turned 16. So by all accounts, all her peeps in her yearbook said, Oh, you normal. You quiet. (laughs) Like, that's who it was. Or like, new school who dis. Yeah. Seen you for a while, but don't know your name. Like, just run of the mill, plain Jane. Like, kind of a wallflower. Yeah. But she was devout like them. Like the others. Like, in the school, she was tried and true. Believed in... God? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Were they Catholic? Well, I think the school was, but she was baptized when she was younger, and all it just said was she was a Christian. Okay. So, 
Well, she could have been christened as a baby, and that's baptized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's what it said, baptized. So this meek girl, Clara, all of a sudden, she started listening to our podcast and got a filthy fucking mouth. (laughs) And she was acting all kinds of crazy. In 1906. In 1906, yes. Well, they kind of noticed that she, you know, again, had a filthy mouth, was acting disrespectful, not... Not her, you know, wallflower self. Mm -hmm. Like, people are like, damn. Like, who is that? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like when Mia Thermopolis was a princess and everyone knew who she was in. Mm -hmm. That's how this was. Okay, thanks. (laughs) Okay, so she's having all of these issues. Mm -hmm. They're like, Italian. Okay, okay, okay. One night, she called out and she said, sister... Please call Father Erasmus. Again, don't know about that pronunciation. I'm going to call him Father E. I must confess and tell everything, but quick, quick, or Satan will kill me. He has me in his power. Nothing blessed is with me. I have thrown away all the medals you gave me. Don't throw away the medals. Mm Mm-hmm. So, they're like, okay. Like, go get the Father. Coming right up. And they're like, Father E., So he comes, Mm -hmm. and so she told him that she had reached out to the devil on her 16th birthday, and she wanted to form a dark pack where, or pact, not pack. (laughs) I mean, she was their wolf pack, you know, whatever. Oh, my. But she wanted to sell her soul to him, but she didn't ever say why she wanted to do that. So we don't understand that part, but she did say that she, like, bargained him, you know, whatever. Now they're in a pack from their pact. Jesus, God. (laughs) No, Satan. (laughs) I know. As soon as I said it, I was like, damn, she's going to walk right into that. (laughs) Okay, so first he's like, okay, dear child, go back to sleep. Doesn't believe her, because he's like... She's being rebellious. I mean, she's been quiet all this time. She's an orphan. That motherfucker. Mm Mm-hmm. So. What can believe people when they tell you shit like that? (laughs) Right? So, whatever. But soon after, she had that erratic behavior again where she was filthy-mouthed, acting up, talking back to the nuns, being disrespectful. And on August 20th, 1906... Two sisters witnessed Clara, and she was tearing at her clothes, growling like an animal, and she was having a conversation where she was shouting at no one. nothing. And they heard her screaming, you betrayed me. You promised me glory, and now you torture me. Mm. Okay, so they try to engage her. And she was in her bedroom. Then they noticed that, you know, again, her clothes were ripped to shreds from her. And her bed frame had been broken. Oh, God. It was just like a wooden bed frame. What I would imagine, like, hostels have now, you know, like, just whatever. Yeah. When they began to help, she started throwing objects at them. Uh Uh-uh. So they were like, peace. Yeah. (laughs) Then, if that wasn't enough, she started... Speaking in foreign languages, which she had no idea about. She spoke Polish, German, French, Latin, and some others. How'd they know? Uh, Well, because other people knew them. These people are educated. Okay. (laughs) I don't know why I got so defensive. I don't know them. (laughs) (laughs) They know it, okay? (laughs) Don't question them. But, okay, so she started out a few words here and there. But then she started being fluent, like, with complete sentences. And then she would go on rants in these different languages. So they were like, "Hmm, that's a little weird. Like, how does she know this? Because Mm -hmm. she's never shown any interest in any languages like this. Mm -hmm. Again, was a wallflower. Right now, she's being a problem child. Minus the red hair. So then when they, like, questioned her about it, how did you find out these languages? How have you learned? Yeah. Because it's 1906. 
She can't just fucking Google. go that stolen that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So she's like, I can't. I can't speak those languages. <gasps> yeah, she had no idea. But it was witnessed like Multiple numerous times. Damn. Yes. So then they started watching her when she would go on these rants and it would be like she was in a trance. Mm-hmm. So then stepping up the ladder of craziness going on, no explanation, what the fuckness yeah. is going on. She started, if she would be in contact with you, she would start spitting out these innermost thoughts of yours. What? Uh Uh-uh. Don't be telling people my shit. Yes. And so, with them being with, like, the nuns and stuff, she would start talking about dark fantasies that they had. and The nuns mm -hmm. or the, oh, shit. Like, all kinds of shit. And so, people didn't want to get around her because they didn't want her to tell their shit. Yeah. So, again, she was saying all this shit, very vulgar. Another time, she was acting like the old Clara. She was chit-chatting, laughing, whatever. Being her jolly old fucking self. So, it was two nuns, her. They weren't scared because she wasn't in the trance. She wasn't doing anything. And then, all of a sudden, she started questioning their belief in God. And saying stuff like, I know you have doubts and just all this shit. Yeah. So then shit went downhill fast. Uh Uh-oh. And so, of course, they're like, blasphemy, blah, 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 you know. And so she started beating on them (gasps) and tearing away their clothes. And she left them, like, barely breathing. Oh, my God. But alive. Then it escalated to sometimes fires would randomly start around her in the kitchen and in her bedroom. And it burned her new bed frame and the sheets, but left her and her clothes unharmed. In the bed? Mm Mm-hmm. What the fuck? So they're like, okay. So then they moved her to a private bedroom. She didn't share with anybody. Her bed and not her caught on fire and she had a fucking roommate? Uh, like, several. Could you imagine being a roommate and, like, pretending like you don't see her fucking bed on fire and just, like, turning over and being like, this bitch be cray. <laughs> right? Can you imagine being her roommate? No. And that's why they were, like, uh, Mm-mm. room assignment, this girl, like, y'all don't believe her, but we believe her, and you need to get her gone. She telling everybody about my fucking wet dream. <laughs> like, I can't even have my... My bullet. <laughs> I know. I don't even get my bullet time. <laughs> she tells everybody. So, she was put in the private room away from the girls. One night, it started with, like, some loud thuds around the mission. And they were like, hmm. Well, so then she started screaming that her door was shaking uncontrollably. But no one was on the outside. They checked. She was, like, in bed. Mm-hmm. Not... Doing it, which, I mean, I'm pretty sure that she could just run back skip and get in there. But, okay. She wasn't out of breath. Right. So, a monk and a nun go into a bar. No. I was just about to say. (laughs) A monk and a nun went to go check, couldn't find anything. Then, later that night, all the doors around the mission began to shake like Clara had described her shaking. Oh, my God. So, people getting scared. Mm -hmm. Like... You get a door shake. You get a door shake. Like, what the fuck? So, a priest, like, went, got a gun, and was, like, going. Because he's, like, what's going on? Oh, shit. Who you gonna call? Priest Busters. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Well, when Clara heard this, she laughed and said, the one who is inside me is only taking delight and pleasure in all of this. Oh, my God. And a gun... He ain't gonna fucking kill a demon. Right. I'm like, uh... He already did. Do you even know... The Muffin Man? Right. Okay. Few more days later, because apparently she's still not really quarantined, just Mm -hmm. like, don't do anything to other people. Mm Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? She began to not be able to be around holy, like, crosses. Yeah. Holy water, anything. And it's not like... Even if they weren't wearing it out of their 
uniform or anything. She, could she sense could, it. Yeah. Damn. So she would start taking roundabout paths where she knew there would be crosses and other mm-hmm. things. So she'd be like walking all the way around. Uh uh-uh, uh, nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. I'm just trying to get to the mess hall and get me <laughs> some mac and cheese. Right. I can't learn about Jesus until my belly is full with carbs. Mm hmm. Carbs and Christ. <laughs> Opposite of Donna's. Carbs and Cox. Carbs and Christ in the morning. Carbs, carbs and Cox, Cox at night. night. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have and to then, have your balance. And then fucking Clara tells all your shit. <laughs> oh, shit. If somehow she came into contact with anything... Blessed. Blessed, religious, whatever. Any kind of relic. She would kind of like unleash... Some kind of savage beast. beast. Oh, God. And she would make unearthly, like, growls and just... Damn. Like a disembodied voice in, you know, just that guttural growl. Like, how did she even make that sound? Yeah. And so, one nun described it as, No animal has made such sounds, neither the lions of East Africa nor the angry bulls. At times, it sounded like a veritable herd of wild beasts orchestrated by Satan, who had formed a hellish choir. Damn. That's quite descriptive. I mean, one, can you write a story for me? Because <laughs> no. you know a lot of descriptive words. <laughs> Two, did you write Jungle Book? <laughs> Lion King. <laughs> With all of that, all these tantrums, they said that she would have this, like, she would possess this strength that the 16-year-old girl yeah. shouldn't be able to do. Yeah. So she started throwing nuns across the room. What? Mm-hmm. So she could barely be held down by four people. Mm-mm. She started to hiss, snarl, growl at people around her. And it wouldn't be like they would provoke her or anything. They weren't making fun of her. She would just... Unleash it. it. Yeah. So the nuns were like, all right, we know this child is possessed. Oh, now they know? Mm Mm-hmm. Jesus, God. One person said that sometimes Clara's neck would kind of grow a little bit, and lumps would form under the skin and move around. Oh, God. Slightly, and then... It would go back to normal again. What the fuck? So it reminds me of, like, in horror movies when something is, like, taking control of their body Mm -hmm. and it's, like, slithering around in there. Oh, God. Yeah. They said that she began levitating up to five feet in the air and, like, her clothes would stick to her body. They wouldn't just, you know, flow down, like... Mm -hmm. If she's in a dress, it wouldn't flow down. It was stuck to her body like static, which isn't normal. Mm-hmm. I mean, levitating is not normal, but right. it's definitely not normal for your clothes to levitate as well. Yeah. And they said if she was sprinkled with holy water, she'd come down and be out of her trance. What? Yeah. Would she just drop or would she slowly go? I wonder. Let me call in 1906. They didn't have... Well, maybe they did. <laughs> Who knows? We looked this up one time because we had this conversation. <laughs> I still don't know what year. I can't either. Oh, and there was this outlandish claim. Someone, someone somewhere said they saw this. That she would transform into a snake-like creature. Oh, hell. But what they, what someone said they meant by that was that her body would become flexible. Oh. And she would just kind of like slump like slump that's a new word slump (laughs) to the ground and like almost like she had no bones like she would just be kind of like like torqued kind of yeah and she would just like slither i feel like it's almost like an army crawl but with no arms like the worm yeah but not she was the og break dancer yeah not break dancing but so she was doing that and it's like uh you move in like rubber yeah and that ain't normal. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. At one point, she bit a nun, <gasps> and it she left puncture marks like snake fangs. Like, they were sharp, and <laughs> I'm doing snake fangs in my 
thing and y'all can't see, but you all know. Mm-hmm. So, after all of this, she met the criteria to be like, oh, she's possessed. Meanwhile, if that damn priest would have listened to her the very first fucking night, right? we wouldn't be telling this story. Exactly. I'm so, I mean, honestly, <laughs> Father E, thank you. <laughs> so, it was Father E, and he was with another guy, Reverend Mansweti. Mansweti? Killing it on these names. <laughs> <laughs> and he was the head of the mission. They were cleared to perform the exorcism. So, on September, some says the 10th and some says the 11th. But September the 11th, 1906, they started the ritual of the exorcism. It lasted from early morning until noon, picked back up again at 3, and continued into the night. They had to break, you know, pee. I'm just kidding. I don't know what they did. Gotta have lunch. (laughs) Whew, I worked out that appetite exercising. <laughs> Did you write that down? No. <laughs> <laughs> One of the first things that Clara did when they came and were like, we're going to exercise you. Mm-hmm. Man, sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <sighs> she knocked away his Bible and like jumped on him like. <laughs> and. <laughs> And his stole that he had on, Mm -hmm. she wrapped it around (gasps) him and began strangling him. Dat bitch. Yep. So, a group of nuns and Father E were like, no, no. That's not nice. (laughs) We need him. And so, pried her off. Then she began hurling shit about, you know, like one does when they're (laughs) possessed. (laughs) Or just mad. Mm Mm-hmm. Then, she started levitating that bitch. Nobody can catch her. Uh Come down here. (laughs) She's like, you can't get me. So then they're like, oh, well, we got you. And a fucking tall person got her down (laughs) like a helium balloon that's up in the (laughs) ceiling. (laughs) And they tied her ass to the bed. You ain't going nowhere now, bitch. Exactly. So two days they were getting this shit out of her. Literally. (laughs) I don't Mm. know. How does that work, actually? <laughs> Speaking of bowel. I mean, maybe demons don't have bowel movements. Well, so. I mean, because, like, if she's not eating and drinking and all that, but, like, she's just like, hold on, I gotta go pee? Hell, she probably just spraying them, like, golden shower. Again, they had the levitation and speaking in tongues now. And they're like, this girl is not mentally ill or, in their words, a lunatic. Mm-hmm. There's no way. Yeah. Then she started to know when she was going to be sprayed with holy water. Okay, so then they started to test it. Because apparently they had all this time. They're like, ooh, let's do a fucking clinical study. I was going to say, randomized control trial right over here. Exactly. They would switch between holy water and regular water. And it really would work that only the holy water would have an effect on her. Damn. Yeah, so they're like, okay, check that, check that. Everything's going according to plan. Mm -hmm. But so then, after she went into all her rages on the holy water, it was like 170 people were like around them then, packed in because they're looking at this girl because it's been going on for two days now. Yeah. And they're like... Let's see what all the fucking fuss is about. Yeah. I mean, I know we'd be rubbernecking over there. I don't know, though. Going up in where a demon is, I don't think I could. Because that demon would hop out of her and jump in me, and I can't do that. Be like, I'm not a warm body. You don't want this. Mm-hmm. I ache all already. Mm-hmm. You don't it's want not this comfortable. Body. <laughs> it's not You're always hungry. <laughs> For carbs and cock. No. <laughs> <laughs> he would just take that Christ right out of there. <laughs> But, so, all of these people are around. They keep doing the holy water, keep doing the holy water. And so, the demon's like, okay. <laughs> or your demon. <laughs> He's like, I am hungry for cock and I haven't had any. Yes. This is, they didn't go into a whole lot of detail on this. But they said that, again, they did the holy water. All of that shit, you know, speaking all of their little mm-hmm. handbook Chant. shit. Yeah. So... 
that happened. Well, then the demon was like, you'll kind of like, if I, if I leave, you'll know because I'll, she'll get off the, like the bed, like she'll levitate. So like after hours and hours and hours of the shit, they're chanting water, chanting water, bathroom break, chanting (laughs) water. She levitated, like contorted a little bit and then fell back. And then she was like, where am I? Yeah, like, I had a dream, and you were there, and you were there. Wizard of Oz, Karen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so she was good. What? Mm-hmm. All is well. However. Oh, shit. In January 1907. So. Just like three months later. hmm She made another pact with that devil. <gasps> that dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? She's a fucking teenager, and they think they are just the smartest people on earth. Well, she on her fucking own this time. Right. So, they got another exorcism. Because they're like, "Uh uh-uh. If you claim this and you act in a little bit funny, we own you, sister. Mm -hmm. We're not waiting like last time. Yeah. So, it lasted two days again. And after the demon departed a second time, they did not talk about her levitating or anything this time. They said that the... Air became filled with a foul smell. Ooh, Mm -hmm. sulfur. Mm Mm-hmm. And then it was gone. Damn. And she was cured. Why does she keep making deals with the devil? Like, what does she want? I have no idea. But so that was the last time anything happened to Clara like that. The priest said that she went on to live a normal life. And they also said that people were trying to say it was just mental illness and all of that. And they're like, no, if she had a mental illness, she would still have these bouts. Right. Because we haven't medicated her. We haven't done any of this. Right. You know. It here, just stopped. It yeah. yeah. So then I saw a lot of websites that said there were no record of her, like, her other life, like, after these mm. two exorcisms. However, I watched a video, again, by someone with an accent. That's why I don't know how to say her fucking name. (laughs) And they said that she died of heart failure in 1912 at the age of 22. Well, yeah. Well, look at all she's been through. Yeah. The girl. First, she was a fucking orphan. Bless her heart. Uh Uh-huh. Then she was taken to a freaking mission. Like boarding school, essentially. Yeah. Like, Wait. And then she turned 16 and she thought she was Sabrina the Teenage Fucking Witch. <laughs> I I want to know, like, what she made the deal for, though. Right. Like, what was so, mm-hmm. like, what did she want so badly that she made not one, two fucking deals with the devil after she'd already had an exorcism? She probably wanted Joe Blow to like her. Maybe. Or maybe she wanted to know who her parents were. Maybe. Or maybe she wanted out of the mission and to be somewhere else. Because she screamed, like, you told me that you would give me glory, and now you're torturing me. Maybe she wanted a different life or something. Like fame or something. Mm-hmm. Did they have fame back then? She wanted to be in silent movies. <laughs> well, she's in a podcast now. R.I.P. Clara. Clara. Whatever your name is. Clarissa explains it all. <laughs> Somebody explain me how to say her name. <laughs> Wow, that was a good one, though, but weird. Right? Like, I feel no closure on it. I know. Like, I need her to be... Well, I mean, she did, but you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Yes. You know what I really need, though, is mm-hmm. to know why the fuck she made the deals. Yes. Like, what was she searching for so much? I know. You know what? The world may never know. True. Unless her ghost tells us. Which, I don't want it to. No, Clara. girl, you stay. You do you. Don't bring that shit to my house. Have your life. I got my St. Benedict's net thing on. She don't like holy shit. It's been <laughs> blessed. So, go away. Yes. Damn. All right. I am doing a Canadian-American serial killer. Okay. Keith Hunter Jesperson, also known as the Happy Face Killer. <gasps> oh, yeah. Oh, You've shit. You've been wanting me to do this since the jump. Keith Hunter Jesperson was born April 6, 1955. He was born in um, British Columbia, Canada. 
he was a middle child, had two brothers, two sisters. His father, like many others, was a very domineering, alcoholic. Son of a bitch. Yeah. And that he says that his paternal grandfather was also pretty violent towards them. I mean, them. that I feel like that's really every freaking time. Yeah. Unless it's the mother. <laughs> so, later on, his dad, Les Jesperson, said, mm, that's not true. I was not abusive. But there was, like, some further investigation after Jesperson was captured that a bunch of other family members was like, no, yeah, he was abusive. Of course he's not going to say he was abusive. He'd be like, no. Right. I was a great father. Father of the fucking year. I have a mug to prove it, you bitch. I bought it myself. (laughs) Don't look at that receipt. Much like other serial killers, Jesperson was one that would torture and kill animals. He was an outcast in his family, got teased a lot, got into trouble. He did graduate from high school, and he got a job as a truck driver in 71. Man. I mean, that's a lie, 74. Uh, no shade to truck drivers. Looking at you, Lisa, you're normal, I think. And if you're not, please be normal. <laughs> I love you. But we've had a lot of serial killers who were truck drivers. Well, I think that it's just because it's one of those professions that they can be in and do what they have to do. True. I don't think it's, you know what I mean? Yeah. They're like, hmm, okay, I could be a lawyer. No, I'd be too busy to kill people. (laughs) I could be, it gives them the opportunities to do what they need to do. Yeah. What they think they need to do. He got married in 1974, had three kids. It's so crazy to think about people who have kids, who have a family, and are twisted enough to kill people. Yep. Be a serial killer. And you have kids. Well, and and he had, I mean, well, we'll talk about it in a minute. Okay, so he was a large man. Just, like, tall and big, very, like... Brawn. Yeah, very, yeah. And so he was made fun of because he was big... And his brothers would call him Igor or Ig. <laughs> That's mean. She <laughs> says the girl who just laughed. <laughs> I mean, it's clever, but. <laughs> he was pretty shy, but he would get into trouble a lot. And when he got into trouble, his dad would punish him pretty violently. He would beat him. He would. He's the set. One thing said his dad would hit him like with a belt in front of others. And I'm like. But, yeah, so did my. <laughs> I mean, I got the belt when yeah. I was a kid, but I mean, I know that's not a thing. Not all kids respond to that, blah, blah, blah. But he would even get electric shock from his father for misbehaving. Fuck. Yeah, his dad was not joking. That's completely normal. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That'll definitely teach him. So even when he was as young as five, that's when he would like kill animals and stuff, and he would even. I thought you were going to say he would eat them. No. And I was like, uh, next level nasty. No. But what he would do is get the animals so that they would fight each other. And he would watch oh them fight God. fight to the death, basically. What the hell? Yeah, what a shitty shit. What kind of animals would he get? Like a dog and a cat? Well, like, yeah, it said that he would capture birds, stray cats, and dogs around their trailer park. And then, like, would beat them and strangle them. Oh, my God. And then he says that his dad was proud of him for that. But I don't know. Whoa. So, when he was about 10 years old, he was friends with this kid named Martin. And they were just little shits together. They would get in trouble all the time. But Jesperson said that a lot of times he would get in trouble for stuff that Martin would do. And so, it pissed him the fuck off. So, he attacked Martin and beat the shit out of Martin until his dad pulled him off of him. Holy fuck. Yeah. Holy fuck. Yeah. He said later that, like, he fully intended to kill him. And then, about a year later, he was swimming in a lake. And apparently, this kid held Jesperson underwater until he blacked out. So, later on, he found that kid at a public swimming pool. And held him underwater until the lifeguard pulled him off. Damn. He's 
like, remember me, Stan? Mm-hmm. Oh, God. Revenge is best served cold. <laughs> he says that he, which, okay, I hate to say, he says that he was blah, 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 because he may have been, and I don't want to downplay that, because this could have been a big deal in his life if it's true, but you just never know what is true and what's not when a serial killer is, like, recounting their life, you know? But he said that he was raped when he was 14. Gosh. And that when he finished high school, he didn't go to college because his dad told him, like, you're not good enough to go. Wow. So, you know how I told you that he did get married and had the three kids. He had two daughters and a son. His wife's name was Rose. And years into the marriage, she thought that Jesperson was having affairs because strange women would call the house. And so, after 14 years of marriage, his wife, while he was... Because he was like an over-the-road trucker. Mm -hmm. And so while he was gone, she just like packed up all the shit and drove. Because at this point, they lived in Washington. They were out of Canada and living in Washington. So she like packed the kids up and drove to Spokane, Washington, to her parents' house. At the time of the divorce, the oldest daughter was 10. And so like he still spent time with his kids. And they officially divorced in 1990. So, when he was 35, this is this is how big he is, six feet, seven and a half inches tall. Holy Hannah. So, 2.02 meters for the Canadians. And he was about 240 pounds or 110 kilograms, which I feel like that's a big guy, but that's not huge for the height that he right. was. Like, that's fairly, not thin, but thin for yeah, his lean. height. For, yeah, for, again, for his height. Yeah. He wanted to be part of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, but, like, it was, like, his lifelong dream. Mm -hmm. But while he was training, he had some sort of injury and couldn't do it anymore because of the injury. And so that was, like, I think a really big deal for him yeah. when, you know, when he was like, well, I can't, I can't fucking do this. You know, so it's, like, between that and the divorce... That's when the killing started happening. Damn. So his first known murder, This is that's where we're going to start. So we're flashing to January 23rd, 1990. This young, beautiful girl. To Did want, you say beautiful? I mean, she may have been. <laughs> no. This young, I'm saying that she's beautiful. I don't actually know. But I'm sure she was. Tawana Bennett was her name. She decided that she wanted to go out for some drinks, meet some friends. This was in Portland, Oregon. And so she was like, look, I'm going to go to this place. It was called B&I Tavern. And she went to have a couple of drinks, had her little beer, had her little wine cooler, mm -hmm. mixing and mingling the drinks and the people and the, you know, as one yeah. does in a bar. According to family and friends, Tawana had some sort of like, I don't know if it was a developmental delay or some sort of intellectual disability. And I don't even really know if that's pertinent. But I think that it may speak to kind of how she ended up in the situation. The trusting nature of her. And, yeah. You know. So, she didn't really pay any attention to Jesperson at the bar. And re really, neither one of them had paid that much attention to each other. But later, he did walk up to her. She was over by the pool tables. And he said, come here often. <laughs> and then he said, do you want a drink? This kind of, this next part is talking about how much she trusted, ev like, everyone and how easy it was for him to befriend her and, you know, her trust him. And again, I think that that goes back to, but I think that goes back to her potential intellectual disability and just not being able to maybe see the dangers ahead. Yeah. And so at one point, Jesperson left the tavern. Didn't really, no reason, didn't didn't even tell her where he was going, but he left. Came back a little bit later and saw Tawana and was like, hey, you want to go for dinner? And she's like, yeah. Well, he checks his wallet and he's like, oh shit, I don't have enough money on me to pay for one of us, much less both of us. Let's go to my house so I can get some more money. Oh gosh. And she's like, okay. One girl, you do not want to scrub. Mm -mm. Well... But he's saying he had the money. He's just like, oh, shit, I don't have it with me. Come with me. You know what I, I mean? Know. I know. I know. But. And she's like, oh, shit, free dinner? I'm so fucking lootly. She likes carbs and cock, too. <laughs> I mean, you're right. You're right. 
But for anyone listening, don't fall for that. Mm -hmm. Do not go back to their house. Yes. Do not pass go. Do collect $200. Yes. So they get back to his house, and I want to say that a couple of different articles said different things about what happened next. One article said that when he attempted to have sex with her, that she was like, absolutely not. And that's when he started beating her. But another thing said that they did have sex and like they start, he started after they had sex, he was kind of taunting her and being mean. And so she was like, um, uh, fuck you. And right. it just created an argument and it got a little bit out of control. And so that's when he started hitting her. Okay. So I'm not really sure exactly how it happened, whether it was he wanted to have sex with her, she refused, and so he beat the fuck out of her, or if it was that kind of argument, yeah, conti- you know, progressed. Either way, he beat her, basically dead, strangled her with his hands. Fuck. And with, well, let me back that up. Strangled her with one hand while he grabbed a rope and wrapped it around her neck and then strangled with that. Holy Hannah. So, after he killed her, because he, so this was like a rent, a house that he rented. After he killed her, he like, I don't know, changed clothes, got dressed, went back to the b and Tavern so he could have a, a few more drinks and like create an alibi. Mm-hmm. So, then he drove back to his house, loaded her body up into the front seat of his friend's car, and took her to like this outskirty type airport. Mm-hmm. So he pulled over, like he's in these back roads, kind of by this secluded little airport thing, and he takes her body out and throws her down this embankment. And then, you know, he, after, so after he gets, like, rid of her body, he drives a little bit, then throws her Walkman out the car, which, sidebar, oh my gosh. hello, 1990, with a fucking Walkman. Oh, one, he should have kept that. I mean, she probably had, like, Savage Garden going on. I think too soon for Savage Garden. Uh, I think Savage Garden was like 97, wasn't it? She had some Nirvana going on. So then he drove a little bit further and threw her purse out the window that had like her ID and all of that. It wasn't until days later that someone passing found her body that had like tumbled down from the embankment. Damn. One, stop being a fucking litter bug too. Right? There wasn't a whole lot of news about it they're just like a couple little short paragraphs they said that she was found half dressed beaten and strangled to death one of her teeth had punctured her lower lip gosh and that she had rope around her neck Mm -mm -mm. they would they did talk about like her physical appearance and you know all these different things about the case now this one article says meanwhile armchair detective laverne pavlyak Saw all of the reports about her. Was a devoted fan of Matlock. Uh, yes, please. Absolutely. Watched mm-hmm. that and Murder She Wrote and In the Heat of the Night <laughs> together. Laverne fancied herself an armchair detective and she's learning all this stuff and she thinks that she's got it all figured out. She thinks that she can use this, the death of poor Tawana, to, fr- to frame. Her boyfriend that lived with her. Oh, my gosh. Well, because he was abusive. Oh. His name was John Sosnovinsky. I do not. I'm I'm so sorry. I'm pretty sure I'm butchering both of their (laughs) names. So, this was her. This was her idea. She was like, okay, I'm going to find out all this shit about the case that I can. And then she went and told detectives, like, I think my boyfriend did this. And, of course, they're like, yes, we need to solve this. Right. Because they had you know, figured out who she was, who the the victim was, but they didn't know, they had no fucking idea who did it. Right. And so they were like, okay, tell us more, you know? Yeah. And because they thought that she had all this information that only the killer could know, yada, 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 they were like, she has to be telling the truth. Meanwhile, I mean, I get why she's doing that, but then if she succeeded in that, there's a killer loose. Mm -hmm. Like, how 
Yeah. Like, I I don't understand because I've never been in that situation. Right. But I don't understand how a victim could want to create another victim. Yeah. Meaning someone else died at the hands of the killer. Not right. a victim as in her piece of shit boyfriend who be- right. beats her. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, fuck him. Yeah. But, yeah, about someone dying. But, I mean, I guess she's in fear of her life. Yeah. And you have to value your life. Yeah. Well, okay. So, she told the detectives that about him beating her and said that she was turning him, turning him in for the rape and the murder of Tawana Bennett. And she said that she was forced by her boyfriend to help him rape Tawana. Oh, my god! And that, again, she used... A lot of details, like, I mean, down to the placement of the rope. She used a lot of details. And so they were like, oh, fuck, this girl knows intimate details of this crime. And so she said that she was forced to help him, like, dispose of the body to cover up the crime. And so they were like, okay, well, you know, we don't have anybody else kind of thing. Let's, you know, keep interviewing some people, figure out what's going on. So, she was even able to take police to point out where Tawana was found. But, like, she couldn't point out, like, where other key stuff was found. Like, the purse, the walkman, yada, yada, yada. Well, the district attorney decided to prosecute. I know I'm jumping ahead, but couldn't they arrest her or charge her? Yes, you're jumping ahead. Okay, so they were both arrested for her death. And so, of course, her... Boyfriend was like, um, I didn't fucking do this. Right. But because he was facing the death penalty, he pled guilty. Holy fuck. And so, with her confession and all, he got life in prison, and she got a minimum of 10 years. Oh, my gosh. And so, she didn't know that she, like, she did not think she was going to get 10 fucking years. And right. And so, she was like, this is more than I wanted. So, while she was in jail, she was like... I made this up. I made this up. And they, of course, by that time, didn't fucking believe her. Right. But I I think that this is a very interesting case in that he pled guilty to something he didn't do. Yeah. Because he thought he was going to die. Right. You know what I mean? And so it's like... How many more cases is mm -hmm. that? And, And so it also goes to show you how someone could make a false confession when they're under that pressure Mm -hmm. and all of that. And it's just like, fuck. Yeah. I mean, how deep does this go? Right. The next murder that Jesperson is connected to, one article I found said it was late July or August of 1992. One said that it was like September 16th, 1992. Wait, is that all we know of them? They're in jail and that's it? Yeah. Holy shit. They didn't get exonerated? I'm sorry. I'm jumping way ahead. I'm doing a carry. <laughs> Okay, so there was an unidentified body of a woman found on August 30th that year, like 10 miles north of Blythe, California. Wait, they were in Portland, and now they're California? Yeah, because remember, he's a truck driver. Oh, yeah. So the investigator said, look, she's been dead for a couple weeks, and she was labeled a Jane Doe. So sad. A month after that... The body of Cynthia Lynn Rose, she was 32, was found on Highway 99 near Turlock, California. She also had been dead for some time, but and they had originally listed her death as an overdose. But when Jesperson started writing his letters to the media, he claimed responsibility for her murder and said that... That she was a sex worker who he picked up at a truck stop. Well, he says that she got into his truck while he was asleep. At a truck okay. Stop. Mm-hmm. Who believes that? Not me. Right. If she's a sex worker, she's trying to make money. She's not just going to be like, oh, let me try this mm-hmm. truck. Mm-hmm. No, she's going to be doing whatever they do at a truck stop. Right. I want to back up just a smidgen. I forgot to say this part that the last victim that I told you all about that had that they had labeled a Jane Doe, Jesperson would later say that her name was Claudia, but I'm almost positive that she's still unidentified. Oh gosh. Mm-hmm. Claudia was my name in high school Latin. 
That's funny. I was in Spanish and mine was uh, Sophia. Oh. <laughs> no, Sophie. I don't fucking know. <laughs> As I just said, kind of alluded to, he was writing, he started writing letters to the Oregon, the Oregonian, sorry, newspaper out of Portland. And he was saying like all the murders that he committed and he would sign his letters with a an actual happy face like circle dot dot smile and so the oregonian dubbed him the happy face killer and so that's how he got his name so remember the first murder was 90 then we jumped to 92 and he was still unknown with like the letter writing all the way to 95 Dang. so that's a little foreshadowing of the foreskin <laughs> his fourth victim was Laurie Ann Pentland. She was from Salem, Oregon. She was only 26 years old. Her body was found in November of 1992 behind a G.I. Joe store in Salem, Oregon. Gosh. I know. She had been strangled, but again, there were no leads. Is it weird that I get pissed off more and, like, sad when they're discarded like that? Than when they're, like, kept underneath the floorboard. I can see. It's because it's a level of disrespect. Yeah. Because. They're just trash. Like. Yeah. You've used them, whatever. You got what you wanted out of them. Yeah. I mean, at least the other people value them Mm -hmm. and wanted to keep them close or want. Like, I don't know. I just. Like, it breaks my heart to think about them just being discarded. Jesperson said that the reason why he killed her was because she tried to double her fee after she had sex with him. And then when he was like, um, a fuck no, she was like, well, I'm going to call the police. And so he strangled her. What fucking sex worker is going right. to be like, this guy ain't paying me. That's fucking, no, a sex worker is not going to call the goddamn police. Right. <laughs> I mean, like, I know I'm getting a little lit over this, but that's fucking stupid. Yes. Yeah, stop Which, lying. Just right. say, I want to fucking kill her. If you're confessing, fucking confess. Yes. You know, and so that's why I say like all the back stuff when I was like, because mm-hmm. I don't want to make light about if he really was like raped as a child or these abuse, you know, all of these things. But it's like when you can't get the truth out of them when yeah. they're confessing and they're telling you they they killed them, but then they're still feeding you these lines of bullshit to right. s- to even to still make them look a little bit better, mm-hmm. which is common in confessions and stuff. Like I know it's a thing. But because yeah. they try to downplay their role. Exactly. But on the other hand, it's like, if you're fucking telling, just fucking tell. Yes. Because if you're confessing to 15 murders or however many, mm-hmm. you're confessing to three murders, one murder, you're going to get in trouble. Like, yeah. So just tell them. Well, and I can understand. I can at least understand on one. Yeah. Because you're like, okay, maybe I could trick them and they think it was self-defense. Exactly. Yes. But on multiple... When you're fucking, you're the the happy face killer and you've been writing, like, just fucking yes. tell them. One, you're the common denominator. Mm-hmm. Everybody's strangled. Everybody gets a smiley face. Right. Well, you know what? I got a frowny face. Because this motherfucker... Mm-hmm. After... These messages... We'll be right back... Just kidding. We're not sponsored. After <laughs> Okay. After Laurie Ann was murdered, it was about six months before his next victim was found in June of 93. She was another woman who was not identified. Gosh. She was a, quote, street person, which aggravates me, but whatever. Oh, my and God. And he said that her name was either Carla or Cindy. But I think it's funny that aren't they all C's? Like the last one. Oh. You know, like I wonder if he, I don't know. Is he making that up? Right. What was his dad's name? Les. Les. I was just wondering if it started with a C. Well, and I do, it's like, okay, so this, this poor Jane Doe, they also thought that she was, she died from a drug overdose was not the fucking case. Way yeah, to like, make general assumptions. Yeah, her her cause of death that the coroner listed was a drug overdose. Wow. Yeah, and it was later reopened and looked into as a homicide after the happy face killer wrote a letter and said he did it. Wow. Okay, another, about a year after that, 
another Jane Doe was found in Crestview, Florida. Jesperson said that her name was Suzanne. She was about 40 years old, so that's one of the oldest victims, but it doesn't matter their age, really. In January of 95, Jesperson said that he would give Angela Surprise a ride from Spokane, Washington to Indiana. So about a week into the trip, Angela supposedly was like, okay, I'm fucking over this damn trip. Like, why is it taking a fucking week? You know, and she wanted him to hurry up because she wanted to go see his boyfriend. His. Um, her, sorry, her boyfriend. And so what does Jesperson do? Rapes and strangles her. Wow. Yep. Okay, you ready for this? This is pretty gruesome. So trigger. Okay. Trigger warning. This one's gruesome. He strapped her to the undercarriage of his truck face down so that he could, quote, grind off her face and prints. What the nastiness? Her body was not found for several months, and then that was only after after he gave the details to the cops. Two months after he murdered Angela, he was like, my girlfriend, because this motherfucker got a fucking girlfriend. What the fuck? All these motherfuckers got girlfriends. Shit. Well, he had big hands, big I feet. I mean, I, you know I like a tall dude like that. <laughs> tall and big like that. He is straight my style. And honestly, though, he was attractive. Like, my kind of attractive. Like, he's... like if Your you look kind at, of attractive goes multiple... She has a broad spectrum. Some of your attractiveness, I'm like, oh, yeah, he's, he's cute. Other ones, I'm like, oh, he's a bulldog. I like the bulldog look. What can I say? It's just strong features. You know, like, I like a manly, strong, whatever. Who gives a shit? After he killed Angela, he, he, like I said, okay, I've already said that part. Sorry. Long-time girlfriend. Julie Ann Winningham was her name. So, he was like, okay, this bitch is only interested in me for my money. And so, he fucking killed her. Strangled her. Yeah. So, this is when he fucked up because he killed somebody he knew. And so that's where police kind of started getting hot on his trail because when the girlfriend dies, who do you look at? The boyfriend. Right. So just like all the other ones, she was strangled. Her nude body was dumped over an embankment. And so everybody knew that that was her boyfriend. And so that was like the first link. So a new detective enters the case, Detective Rick Buckner. And he's the one that gets on the Winningham case, his girlfriend's case. And he knew that she was, he, you know, she was dating a guy named Keith Jesperson. She said that he was her fiance and that they met at a truck stop where she had hitched a ride with him from Utah to Washington. And a number of her friends were like, Jesperson, he's a big guy. Some people said he was a giant. <laughs> Some people called him a baby Huey type. <laughs> <laughs> damn throwback oh my god that's what donna and i say when we have on a too small shirt <laughs> so he didn't have great fashion sense he didn't know how to dress his body type yes oh god that is great though the baby huey type <laughs> we could be friends with those people Mm-hmm. okay so like i said he fucked up killed somebody new cops were on his trail right so the police started questioning him and he was like, I'm not going to fucking talk. And he was like, um, I won't talk, but I'll write you a letter. Yeah. And they kept asking him, like, if he wanted an attorney. And when he said he did, they were like, well, why do you want an attorney? Do you need one? Which, let me just say. Mm -hmm. Get on that soapbox, girl. I agree wholeheartedly. I 100% respect law enforcement and all, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. However... It is your fucking right to have an attorney present yes. to answer any fucking questions you want. Yeah. Because how many people, and if you are not under arrest, you can fucking get up and leave anytime you want to. Yes. And if they tell you you can't, they're lying. Yep. Because if they haven't arrested you, you can leave. Yep. So, and if I, there are any attorneys listening and I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong, but... Do not let a police officer make you feel, or anybody, like, interrogating you. You know, mm -hmm. whether it's, like, local police, a sheriff, a 
fucking FBI agent. If anybody is asking you questions and you want an attorney present, you have every fucking right. And do not make them let you think that just because you're asking for an attorney, it makes you look guilty. Because right. who the fuck cares? Because if you're not guilty and they think it makes you look guilty, we'll find the fucking evidence against you because it's not there. Exactly. And... You don't want to be put in a situation where you have some sort of false confession because they've had you in a fucking interrogation room for 15 hours. Exactly. So, you can take away, you can get the fuck up, and you can get an attorney who gives a, who gives a damn what it looks like. Exactly. Get you a fucking attorney. Cover your own ass. Always. Because, because they don't care. No, and it's like, you know... Are there amazing police officers out there? Absolutely. Sure. And I'm not saying that cops are bad because of this. They're trying to solve their case. And if they mm -hmm. truly think that you, they, in their heart of hearts, may not think they're doing anything wrong. Yeah. Well, the, and they're under pressure, too. And then, yeah, if you're, if they find your name in this shit, they're like, suspect. Mm-hmm. Until proving otherwise. Yeah. And so. Proven otherwise. So you have to take care of you. Mm -hmm. And you get a fucking attorney. That's what I tell, like, everybody, all, like, all my family members. You know, I'm like, I don't care what it's about. You fucking call an attorney before you open your mouth. Yeah. I remember there was this episode of Snapped one time that the girl, like, kill, of course it was Snapped. So the girl killed her husband or boyfriend or something. And when the police were interrogating her, they would ask her a question and she would say, I want an attorney. They would ask her a question. Like, they asked her so many questions. And I think it went on for, like, 14 minutes or something like that. Wow. And every single time they asked her a question, she would say, I want an attorney. I want an attorney. And the Snapped episode had her defense attorney on there. And she was like, I could not have asked for a better client because from the jump, she kept her mouth shut and asked for an attorney. Yeah. When the attorney gets there... Help them out. If you're, you know, you're trying to yeah. help them solve a case and you have information, share it. Yeah. Help them solve cases, but protect yourself. Yeah. So, stepping off my soapbox. I wholeheartedly agree. Okay. Just helping you out. Mm-hmm. Just helping you out. Mm-hmm. So, supposedly, on March 22nd, he tried to kill himself with overdosing on over-the-counter sleep medicine. And according to him, his body rejected the sleep aids. Oh, gosh. Um, so he tried it twice. And so on March 24th, he was like, okay, the police are going to nail me for this murder. Like, it's it's going to happen. Yeah. So he is like... Inevitable. Yeah. So he thought if he turned himself in, that he would get some leniency. So he wrote letters to one of his kids and to his brother. Damn, not to choose favorites, but... Basically... Sum it up. He's like, my luck run, has run out. Sorry it turned out this way. I've been a killer for five years. I've killed eight people, assaulted more, blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry it ended up this way. I meant to be a killer and live free. Right. Okay. So, the police arrest him on March 30th, 1995. And so, after they arrested him, he called his brother and was like, destroy the fucking letter. <laughs> Because, <laughs> oops, you know. He's like, like, did he say, don't read it, destroy it? I don't know. I, would, I didn't, I don't uh -huh. know. <laughs> and so, his brother is, like, talks to his attorney and talk, because his brother's fucking smart and talked mm -hmm. to a fucking attorney and his dad and was like, guys, what do I do? And they were like, um, you give the letter to the police. Oh, and so, for sure. Yeah. And so, they turned it over. And then it, you know, became evidence. And so they used, they had the letter, they had some DNA matches, they used Jesperson's travel logs for his, com yeah. for, for his computer is what I almost said, for his trucking company and mm -hmm. started mapping out these, these. Gotcha. Yeah. And finding, oh, he killed her. He killed her. He, you know, started putting all these yeah. pieces together. And so while he was in custody, he started spilling the beans, which of course he later recanted. However... At one point, he claimed to have killed as many as 185 people. Holy fuck. Yes. But only eight women from California, Florida, Nebraska, Oregon, Washington, and Wyoming have been confirmed. Wow. Yep. He is such a paradox. I killed 100 and blah, blah, blah people. 
but it's because they did me wrong. Mm-hmm. The, I didn't want to kill, but you she know, she was going to call the cops. Yeah, yeah. It's like either be proud about it and be boastful, or be this manipulative mm-hmm. victim. Yep, you can't be both. Right. So he is serving three consecutive life sentences at the Oregon State Penitentiary in Salem, Oregon. And then September 2009, he was indicted for murder in Riverside County, California, and was extradited to face the charges in December. There he was convicted of that murder and got his fourth life sentence in January 2010. We're going to kind of back up a little bit. Remember old Laverne and her boyfriend? Uh Uh-huh. So five years into their conviction... They were released because Jesperson confessed to it and with the evidence of his guilt and like he was able to tell the police the location of her purse and yada, 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 the details that Levon couldn't, they were released and he obviously was in jail for that. But did she get charged anymore? I don't think so, but she should have fucking stayed in jail for perjury and all of that shit. Yeah. So it was like time served. But it's her own fucking fault. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. When the kind of the the happy face stuff, I touched on it a little bit, him writing to the Oregonian and stuff. But so after Tawana Bennett's murder, when Laverne was doing that and all the news media and stuff was focusing on them for the murder, that's when he wrote the confession on the bathroom wall of a truck stop and signed it with a smiley face. Oh. So that didn't get the attention he wanted. And so he was like, okay. And so he wrote, started writing letters to media and police departments confessing to the murders. Yeah. And that the first one was a six-page letter that he wrote to the Oregonian. Oh, good God. And get to the point. <laughs> Can I please have the, what are those called? Cliff Notes version yes. of this, please? Ain't nobody got time for that. No. Give me, can I get this on an audiobook, please? <laughs> and then, okay, so, but on that, like, six-page letter that he wrote with all the details of his killing, he signed that with the smiley face, too. And then that's when Phil Stanford of the Oregonian dubbed him the happy face killer. Okay, so, kind of up-to-date stuff. His daughter... Melissa Moore is her name. She has done a lot of TV about him. Not necessarily bad, but I think that, like, I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, but, like, she's been on, like, Dr. Phil and Oprah and some Lifetime movies and 2020, and she was on an episode of Evil Lives Here. I love that show. Yes, if you want to go back and watch that, it's on ID. It was on the app, too, so I, if you want to watch that, you can. Hey. Um, it was the March 18, 2018 episode, and it was put a... Ha- <laughs> the- <laughs> Cleverly named. It was named Put on a Happy Face. Dang. So, there was just... She's just done, like, a lot of... I mean, new she's stuff turning about, uh, lemons into lemonade. Well, and I think that what's important, too, is that, just like we said with the whole premise of the Evil Lives Here series, is that it highlights the victims of the killer's family or the the family members of the killer who are victims i guess i should say yeah and that she grew up with this dad and and evil lives here there was like they were playing like home videos and stuff like that of them together and you know just all these things and it was like you know she was like 10 when her parents divorced. Wow. And then it wasn't long after that that he started killing. And so, yeah, you know, she grew up with this father who was, you know, a little domineering, and a little whatever, but he was her dad and, you know, all these things. And then yeah. ended up he's a murderer, a right. serial killer at that. And so I just, I don't know, it's just interesting. And so it's a good watch if you want to watch that. There, I did find an article with some a list of people that he claimed that he killed, and it would be like fake names. Like there was one in named Bobby in Oregon, and one named Lynn in Nevada, one named Susan in Oklahoma. You know, yeah, just be like these first names, and a lot of them were Jane Doe's, or there's a Karen, or a Carrie, or a Carol, or a right Jane Doe, Jane Doe. You know, one thing also said that he claim that he killed 160 people. So, I mean, right. There's a lot 
There was a whole little article I found, too, that was called Jesperson the Liar. I mean... Yeah. All right. So, that's it. That's the happy face killer who is not so happy. No. All right. So, what did we learn? Believe people... Well, I don't know. I was going to say believe people when they tell you shit. Because nobody fucking believed your girl Mm -hmm. the very first night that she said, "Uh, Hello, I'm possessed. But... People did believe Laverne, and she was fucking lying. Right. So, I don't know what to say then. (laughs) Okay, definitely not that. But you should believe people. It should be depending on what they say. Oi. Well, I mean, good God. Would you believe... Okay, if somebody walked up to you and was like, I'm possessed. Well... Or if somebody walked up to you and was like, my boyfriend who beats the fuck out of me... Made me go with him so true. to kill someone, and he. I had to watch him. You know what I mean? Yes, yeah, so true. Like, she's who I would believe way before somebody being like, hey, I made a deal with the devil, and I'm fucking possessed. Yeah, true, 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 true. So, I don't like that number one at all. Yep, let's erase that. Number one, don't make a pact with the devil. Or a pack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The only thing I want is, like, a pack of gum. Uh-huh. I was just about to say that. A pack of Twizzlers. I do. That was used to be my study food. Yeah, it used to be. Which is why I gained so much weight in grad school. <laughs> <laughs> and number two, don't fucking do it twice. <laughs> Learn from your mistakes. Yes. Sheesh. Right? Also, learn from your mistakes and don't falsely accuse people. Like, don't try to get revenge on people. Mm-hmm. That should just be it. Don't try to get revenge on people like that. Yeah. Because. Because you just fucked 1,500 other people. Right. Like, your actions have consequences. And in this case, people fucking died. Right. And three, check yourself. Before you wreck yourself. A.K.A. get an attorney. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Protect yourself in all situations. Yeah. Yeah. Don't crawl in somebody's truck cab when they're sleeping. (laughs) Yes, allegedly. That did not happen. Just protect yourself. Yeah. Don't be afraid to ask for an attorney. Don't be afraid to say no to a guy at a bar. You know, don't be afraid to say no. Don't be afraid to say, go fuck yourself. Mm Mm-hmm. And remember, creep it real and and don't don't get get scared. scared.